in the desert of Set. I'm G.B. Marion. I write about life as a setian in contemporary times with random long-winded detours into ancient history, classic monster movies, and all kinds of other fun stuff. Won't you join me for today's adventure? If you'd like to read a free electronic print copy of the following recording, please visit desertofset.com. The Praying Mantis God of Ancient Egypt. For today's adventure, we have a very special guest, the artist Setken, who creates neo pharaonic art inspired by the ancient Kemetic, or Egyptian, Necheru. Setken's artistic range extends beyond painting, even though the latter is his primary focus. This includes singing and writing in a band, physique and physical display escapades, as well as writing and acting. This magnificent servant of the Necheru has just released a mini-documentary about the praying mantis god of ancient Egypt, which concerns a little-known Necher by the name of Abit. Listeners can view the film for free at vimeo.com slash setken, and I encourage everyone to check it out. And now, without any further ado, please welcome Setken. Setken, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on here, GB. It's an honor. I just want to say I'm not just blowing steam up your ass. Uh, you really are one of my favorite artists. I, all of your paintings that you have been producing that I've seen over the past, what, what has it been, a decade? Yeah, it's getting close to a decade now. Yes, especially the winged set piece. That one has mm. definitely always been my favorite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's um, uh, it's one of it's still one of my favorites. And um, I was just remarking to a friend tonight that I don't know how I actually created that piece as early on uh, in my painting career as I did because it was um way way ahead of what i was doing at the time what year was that uh that was 2013. okay so um it's coming up to its seven year anniversary um but that that is still one of my favorite paintings well i guess that uh opens the door for what we're really here to discuss tonight a very well unknown ancient Egyptian deity by the name of Abid. Right. Mantis God, whom mm. of whom or for whom, I should probably say, uh, you have just recently directed, produced, released a short documentary entitled The Praying Mantis God of Ancient Egypt. Right. I just want to thank you for for making this thing in the first place because the the end product is just amazing amazingly um, uh, educational and spiritual to watch. Well, thanks and and thank also thanks for your kind words about my paintings before as well. I I didn't quite get that in. Um but for a first crack at trying to find new ways to show my art, which is part of how the documentary emerged. Um, I'm, I'm happy with um, the way it's, it's turned out. Um, you know, there are some rough edges to it, but um, as, a, 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 as a short experimental documentary, I'm... Um, I'm happy with how it how it turned out, so I'm glad that you and now that more people have started to see it as well, 
um, that you and others are uh, starting to find some value in it. I'll probably mention this multiple times as we speak, but uh, for the listeners, this video is currently available at uh, setchemsvimeo.com website. Is that correct? Yeah. If you um, if you go to Vimeo and key in setchem, um, all of the my public videos are there. Um, or alternatively, you can go to my website. And at the very bottom of the page, all of my social media contacts are there, you know, along the social media bar at the bottom. There's like right. five different socials you can have a look at and that will lead you to the documentary one way or the other because it's really all I've been raving on about at the moment. So, Shit, what was my next question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you, 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 you started to ask about a beat and we got because uh, it was unknown and everything and then we got distracted so can you can you can you talk a little more about um uh this sort of multimedia approach that you're that you're that you're uh, taking sure um so i did my one and only um exhibition in 20 at the beginning of 2018 and um, we made a documentary about that as well called neo because that was the neo I should um, pronounce that properly. Um, that was the name of the exhibition and we did a 15-minute uh, documentary about that, which is also on that Vimeo site if people are keen to see that. And whilst I'm glad that I did it, I came away with a feeling of dissatisfaction that this is the only way to show my art because it's the accepted way. And that made me think about the history of art and how it's traditionally been used and shown, all of that stuff that I'm sure you would probably explore by going to art school, which I never did. Um, and I came out of it feeling that it's unacceptable that that should be the only way I get to show, you know, my work, which is representative of, you know, hours and hours of creative time and, you know, painted from the depths of my souls or whatever. So I started to think more and more about how there could be different ways to show what I'm doing that even perhaps used the paintings as a kind of a springboard to move into something else. And that's, that's how it began. I, um, started to write short film scripts where the paintings were uh, pivotal in the storyline, which, you know, it was a short like, five-minute films. So there wasn't that much of a big storyline to go with it, but it was very visual. But then came up against the thing of, well, to fund something like that is going to be, you know, a small fortune just to get it, the, the basics filmed, um, you know, having someone to film it, directors, lighting, all, all, all of that sort of stuff, sets, special effects. So those projects all got left um, on the sideline. Um, but um, fast forward to pandemic times and um, I've got, it's a Galaxy Note 10 camera phone thing. It's more of a camera than it is a phone, I think, and a multimedia station. And I've had that for quite a few months and had already worked out that the filming capabilities on this thing were pretty amazing because I've, I have been filming my paintings and putting them up on my Patreon 
for people to get a you know a good look at them, whatever. So um, I guess that sat in the back of my mind, and then when the Abitus, the Abit Mantis documentary came into being, it was almost like you know the gates are open now, off you go, and I did um, pretty well all the filming for it myself wrote the script um one piece uh had to be filmed um outdoors so uh, a friend filmed that for me but apart from apart from that all of the raw material i had actually made i created it was there so i didn't have to wait for funding or someone else to come in and help me i i got a simple editing suite mm -hmm. thing um, that I downloaded and, you know, went from there. And then to pull the final product uh, together um, wasn't very difficult at all because I had um, yourself who contributed the music and my friend uh, Patamas who, who contributed the, uh, the transliterations of the texts. Um, Basically, I got uh, my friend Christian from Space Tone to do the editing, and it was complete. So um, the process was a lot smoother and slicker um, out of necessity, because um, the other thing is, of course, you can't have too many people around when you're in a stage four lockdown helping you to make a film. Uh, so, understandable. So that, yeah. that's how that came about. I have to imagine, um, I have to imagine this, this more uh, simpler process is also a little bit more affordable. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I'd already had the lights, the colored lights that I used in the video. I already had them because I used them in my ritual space. Um, I already had the plinths made up from the neo pharaonic exhibition, you know, um, the, the plinths with my uh, cartouche logo on it. I so, love the shot had, with the mantis on it, by the way. That, that particular shot's probably my favorite in the whole film. Oh, yeah, it's cool, huh? Mm -hmm. Um, well, he's that particular mantis is, um, really um, my, what I use in place of a statue of a beat in my altar, because there are no statues of him yet. So um, I basically got that from a kid's play set, painted it up in this super cool black paint, which I just happened to have sitting here, that this guy in England makes. It's um, meant to be a take on Vanta Black. Uh, which is the black that they're using to paint airplanes and things, so that it looks like you're looking into a black hole. Well, you um, you, just, you impressed the hell out of me because I thought I thought that was an actual bug in that shot. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> really, I did. So right up until me to saying now. Yes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> So either you well, did a really good job or I'm just totally losing my eyesight or something, but I, I, I thought it was real. Well, um, look, there's that particular statue has been on my um, altar for some time. So there's been a lot of Heka around it. Mm -hmm. And besides that particularly amazing black, um, I, I gave it those purple eyes and there's all magic associated with all of that. So it has got a, uh, a kind of life to it. I'm, I'm glad that it had that effect. Maybe everyone else thinks that as well. That's really cool that you yeah, thought that was I, the real mantis. I thought it was real. That's wow. cool. That could be the highlight of my day, actually. Oh, good. Well, uh, that, that opens the door nicely uh, to start discussing just who is a beat exactly? So, I got to be honest with you. I, I didn't even, I didn't even know that there were mantises in Egypt. Mm. Yes, 
Um, so the Egyptians were very keen observers of nature and um, besides wall art, um, where there are depictions of, you know, life in the swamps that feature, you know, different insects, the, um, the abete mantis was actually used as a glyph um, in one place in particular, which was King Seti I's tomb. And um, it is a piece taken from uh, the book of Opening the Mouth. Um, it's probably not a, um, it's probably not a surprise that people may not be aware of it because that tomb until very, very recently has been closed for about 50 years um, because it's one of the most spectacular uh, tombs as far as tomb decoration goes in Egypt, if, if, not, one of, if not one of the most, the most. Um, it was deteriorating very badly so the Ministry of Antiquities closed it permanently, mm. but uh, they only reopened it um, within the last 18 months. It's very, very uh, recent that they, they've reopened it. Wow. And as I understand it, this particular line that features um, the mantis, which I've, I made a sketch of, and that goes all the way through the documentary and is on the, the poster and stuff and is featured in a colorized and filled out version at the top of my painting Cemetery. Um, it, it is basically that glyph and it's unusual because they've emphasized the long neck, which I comment about um, in the documentary. And um, because of the habits, and the way the creature behaves, some Egyptologists have remarked that it's strange that we haven't heard more about the deity than we have, just by, I guess it's freaky nature alone, and the way it, you know, it does look like it's praying and looking at you and everything else. Um, the other two texts where a beat is mentioned, um, his name is spelt out um, with, with the hieroglyphs and the determinatives that, are, that have been used. A determinative is, um, I'm studying um, Egyptian hieroglyphs at the moment. So a determinative is a glyph which will be placed at the end of a sentence to let you know what it is is being referred to in case that's unclear. Okay. So um, they, in the, the two texts that I have mentioned in the documentary, in one case they've actually used the pintail duck and another this wingless fly which um, doesn't appear very much anywhere else. Um, and I believe that there is a, some versions of the text actually include a bee itself, because of course the, uh, the Book of the Dead was translated over and over and put inside coffins and things at different stages of, um, Egyptian history. So um, there, there would have been scribes that have perhaps used different glyphs for different things rather than translating the exact original over time. But this, I think, points to the fact that a beat may not be as easy to pin down in one form as perhaps some of the other Neturu. Mm. Um, this could well allude to it, but we know that from 
the glyphs that are being used, it's there are references to him flying, something that is able to lift up, something that is able to go away from the ground and make its way. And um, for, for this reason, this, uh, because it's not spelled out in the texts uh, e exactly who and what he is, Egyptologists have argued, well, you know, are they referring to a deity? Is it saying that this creature in and of itself is the thing that's showing the person past the king's house into the realm of the gods? Well, we know as mystics and people who have an interest in the numinous that the ancients wouldn't just simply list something mundane in terms of or in relation to the divine. Right. And I think the key, right. the key text here is the one from Seti's tomb, the one from um, the opening of the mouth, where the actual mantis itself is used um, as the determinative and as a word itself um, in the phrase. And the phrase is, I've seen my father in his every form, the form of the abit mantis. Well, the king is divine and born of the divine. So to suggest that he isn't um, would be, you know, a blas a, a comedic blasphemy. Right. So, so, so I think that text is a qualifier as far as, you know, conservative Egyptology goes. Um, my experiences that have developed with the deity over the years paint a picture of him and who and what he is that is, you know, entirely related to my experience. Um, but I do find synchronicities here and there that crop up. Um, and um, I also note that the Iksam tribe in South Africa had a praying mantis god called Ikagan, mm. who his primary form was a praying mantis, but he also had many other forms, and they emphasized that. Huh. Mm. Wow. Well, I, I, yeah, I was just going back to the glyphs. Um, the fact that, like, I can, I, can, I can see the bee and the wingless fly, but then they throw in the duck, and it's like, what? Right. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm still getting to the bottom of the duck thing as well. I'm not sure exactly why the duck is there in that context, but um, the... It does, it does remind me of another thing, though, that I meant to mention to you earlier, um, and I it would take some further investigation on my part to really delve into it and i'm not exactly sure how practical it would be however um i know that kenneth grant made a lot he he he, he wrote often about the symbolism of the bee like bees are very significant in the typhonian tradition of thelema for some reason right. not exactly clear I'm not the best person to explain why I'd have to do some further research on that, but uh, for, I don't know why that suddenly made me remember that though. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm now that I've, you've given me that thread, I'll investigate it. The B is definitely one like Budge when he did the translation of the opening of the mouth. He, after he did the, the translation or transliteration, he said it, it is unclear. He said, I, he said, I'm unclear about this because on the one hand, it's mantis. On the other hand, it's bee and the hornet is in there as well. 
and they had glyphs for 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 all three so for some reason it's deliberately unclear but um i feel the energy of the bee much more aligned to a beat than perhaps the dark and i've noticed that when i paint um a beat in profile his head on the side it does look like like you could look at that and think it was a bee i could see that i could mm. see that yeah so um i'll have a look at uh what um kenneth grant has written the the bee itself and, and I, I mentioned this in the documentary is pronounced beat not a beat but beat um, and of course we're speculating about the um the vowel sounds of course where we can only guess at that um because we um the language has been lost but the B was one of the, I, I guess, determinatives used whenever the king's name was written. The B and the reed basically meant you were talking about the pharaoh. Mantises, bees, hornets, wingless flies, and ducks. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if you look into the, um, the exam, tribe and i i hope i'm saying that right it's that tribe is spelled i x a m okay. um he's tied up with other creatures as well like mammals so wow. this isn't the first time you know that a egyptian nature has many forms or many creatures associated with it like look at set for example exactly we, we we would say that the Shah is most likely his most identifiable and predominant form. But then there is, of course, you know, the oryx and the right. gazelle and the pig and panthers, mm -hmm. so, um, etc. So, um, and I had a lot of fun painting set in his anthropomorphic oryx form in one of my paintings. Oh yeah, I remember that. I love that painting. Yeah, I, I only just fairly recently made the uh, connection myself on that point, but like the, the, the fact that Set is also kind of another horned god. Yeah, yeah, Pro probably the original one. Back to our beat though. I'm just curious. Mm. Do we wonder? Do do we know if it is a male deity or a female deity, or maybe something different? Um, I think because in one of the texts, specifically, the male is referenced in that one. My, I've seen my father in his every form, um, and. I sense, you know, when I connect with him in meditation or whatever, that that he is male. Okay. I, I sense I sense that. So when did you first become interested in Abi exactly? So um, I I keep uh, diaries of my dreams, and I will write my dreams down after they they happen and also meditation experiences and i noticed this praying mantis being showing up um in various contexts so um i was unsure at that stage who and what he was because i couldn't find him attested to in the uh, literature that's been uncovered over time from ancient Kemet. So the relationship more or less continued with me not knowing too much about him or who he is. 
And I think that was the way it had to be in the beginning. And to a large degree, it's the way that it has to be now because I, I think he is tied up with the high mysteries of life. Mm. And when you get involved with him, you're looking under the skirt of reality and creation and evolution and beingness. And, you know, you may not be prepared for, for what you're going to see. So um, the more I was seeing and interacting with him in that state, I guess the more voracious I became in my investigation. And the uh, Egyptologist Linda Evans is the only one who has written a academic paper about the praying mantis in ancient Egypt. Oh. And it's, it's a good paper. And I, I wrote to her after it and, um, you know, didn't get a reply. Um, you know, and that happens. Right. So she made reference to a praying mantis coffin being found an anthropomorphic coffin and a mummified mantis inside. Oh, wow. And I thought, I thought, you know, that's, that's weird because until very recently, like even the last 12 months, let, let's say 18 months, we hadn't found mummified insects. And yeah. we know that, we, we know that, for example, the scarab is sacred to Kepera. We found them now. They unearthed uh, a tomb where there were mummified scarabs. That is so cool. It is so cool. So I went on a quest to try and find pictures of this mantis coffin and mummy, and I couldn't find it anywhere. I wrote to... Uh, so Bernard Briere is the Egyptologist who discovered it back in uh, 1929. And I wrote to the museums in Brussels because he's Belgian and that's where all his work ended up. Could not get an answer Tr and tried. I tried Google search. I tried everything. And Occasionally, and I noticed this with things that, uh, and it happened with uh, the um, that phrase that I read of the Seti the First uh, reference to a beat, that one where I've seen my father in his every form. Um, that finally came about after years of looking for it um, via Patamasu because he's got um, access to like the, the hardcore original translations of these texts as they were found, um, like back in the 1800s, although sorry, the early 1900s. Oh, so no. so he, he was able to come up and find that for me. So this is how my research seems to go. I'll have a, a period of intense looking for something. You'll let it go. And then all of a sudden something emerges. And this is what happened with the Mantis coffin. Um, I get this magazine called Nile. I just subscribe to it. And even though their delivery of the magazine is rather random, seems to show up whenever they feel like sending it out. <laughs> oh my goodness. It, yeah. It doesn't seem to be what I'd call a, a, Periodically. Uh, by, well, it's a, it's more an annual at the moment. <laughs> but this um, company, a, a bookshop in France called Merit Sega Books advertised in it. Ooh. And I thought, I'm going to write to this guy and see if he knows. And his name is Francois, the gentleman that runs the shop. And he wrote back to me, so that, that was something new. So, someone uh, writing back. <laughs> that's always nice. It's, it is nice. Um, 
because um, unfortunately it, with academia, if you're writing to academics, they're going to be looking for the letters after your name or the institution you're studying at. And if you don't have those, they probably relegate it to the pile of, well, you know, this is not worthy of my time or, or I don't have time to do it, whatever. Right. So anyway, this guy wrote back and said, can you give me more information? Do you know if it was published in a periodical? Do you know? Blah? So I looked and I went back to Linda Evans's paper and it did have references to where it was because oh. academics have to do that. They have to say where it was cited. So I sent it back to him and then within a day he had sent me a, a image, a PDF of um, the mantis coffin, wow. uh, which is anthro, anthropoid, and the head looks mantis-ish and human at the same time. Man. Um, and then the inside of it, which is, you know, a disintegrated mantis mummy. And when I, when I saw that, when I got that, that's in that moment, the documentary was born. I had to do something with it. I just had to. And um, I didn't think about it a lot. I was in a particularly raw creative state because, you know, I'm not working at the moment because we're in stage four lockdowns. I haven't been working most of the year. And I just had this open space to do, you know, what I wanted to do. And, and, and that's how it, it came about. That's, that's just such a nice story. Amazing, man. I mean, really cool of that guy to answer you and, and send you that photo. And what a find. Like, I just still, I'm still getting over the fact that, uh, that, that they mummified mantises too. Right. So, so that also speaks of, they've, they've mummified other creatures that we don't necessarily associate with deity, but is it because we haven't associated them with deity yet? Uh, are we waiting for a text that will have the nature determinative to say, well, this is a deity? In fact, the comedics, you know, they associated all, all kinds of creatures with all kinds of gods. So um, perhaps we need to rethink how the ancients were thinking about deity per se. That, that's my take on it. Well, it makes sense and it seems only logical. I mean a religion in which so much of nature is considered divine and right. why would they why would they draw the line in mantises you know like they 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 there's 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 cats and there's there's cows and there's falcons and there's ibises and there's jackals and there's everybody's so why not mantises Right, right. It just doesn't make well, sense. Well, I think further down the track, um, because they are making more discoveries um, in Egypt, you know, we, we are, according to archaeology and Egyptology, they've only uncovered not even a third of what they know is there. And mm -hmm. as ground penetrating radar gets more and more sophisticated, you know, we're likely to get a much larger picture of um, ancient Egypt. And as that emerges, I guess the question is going to be, will Egyptology as a science be able to keep up? Because, um, it's not changed a lot in the 200 years that has been around. And they've got some pretty set ideas about how, um, how, they're, how they're looking at that part of our ancient history. Mm. Um, 
that I'm not saying is necessarily wrong, right. but um, when a cross-discipline scientist comes into the fold, and I guess like all the disciplines, they, they don't want to share their work with anyone else that's going to perhaps challenge their own findings because we're talking tenure and publications that need to be changed, et cetera. But, you know, we all know the story of John Anthony West's friend, Robert Shock, who just happened to accompany him on a trip to Egypt. And as I understand it, he didn't have a particularly big interest in Egyptology itself, apart from the general fascination of it that most people have got. And he's standing at the Sphinx enclosure and he's a geologist and just happens to look at the walls and realise that they, the dating of the Sphinx is quite likely wrong. It's thousands hmm. of years older than um, what was thought. So they, they did test it. They went and tested the, the enclosure and the Sphinx itself and, and the conclusions according to geology is that that thing was carved originally about 10,000 years ago. And traditionally, Egyptology will not accept that. Yeah, they, they, wow. They, they want to align it to the reign of King Khufu. So that, that, that's an interesting case in point. So earlier you mentioned ritual space. Yeah. And I believe that this is the same space in which you filmed uh, the uh, artistic sequences of the film. Is that correct? So I, I recreated my ritual space in my outdoor shed um, because it's larger and I could set it up to look more visually uh, appealing. But um, I used the plinths, I used the, the incense and the, the lights to get the same kind of feeling that I get in my shrine room. Mm. But I, I basically converted my shed into a studio to get, uh, to get those um, ritual sequences. That is amazing. And also something that I really kind of want to do. <laughs> yeah. Like, You'd be good at it. So what, what, what's next? What, what kind of, um, projects are you thinking about exploring next? Well, um, pretty well all, most of the paintings I've done this year are studies, which means that they are preparation for the final version of that work. Mm. So the, the three studies that I've created so far, and there's a fourth one coming, um, will eventually go into their final painting form. So that's the next stage. Um, there's more paintings coming featuring sacred texts. Mm. They gener kind of generate paintings on their own. I'm thinking about recreating two of my earlier paintings that for some reason I'm either unhappy with in the case of one and just that I think that I can tell more of a story in the case of the second by doing mm. another version of it. So that that's more on the painting side. As far as video projects go, I'm doing a, a new video project for Nehebu Kao, who is the snake god or one of the snake gods um, of the Kemetic Pantheon and your listeners will be interested to know that you're, you've done the music for that as well um, because of course, and we've not really mentioned this, you did the music for um, the um, Praying Mantis of Ancient Egypt documentary. Oh shit, yeah, I did shit the whole time, I didn't even think about that. But there'll be a video project about Mehebu Kal, which won't be a documentary, it's something a bit different. And then um, I'm revisiting my painting Winged Set because it, uh, that painting is seven years old this year. 
So there's a project there related to that. Seven, lucky um, seven. Yeah, lucky seven, right? Um, I want to put the Praying Mantis God of Ancient Egypt onto a DVD um, with a special, uh, the, the, uh, the ritual sequences that I made a special oh, just right. for patrons. I think that, that comes out today for patrons as well. So I'll put that on the same DVD and have that for, you know, as something to give to future patrons. You know, yeah. you, you join up on any whatever tier and you get sent that. Um, I want to go back to Egypt. To uh, revisit some favorite places or to explore something new? Well, to explore something new, they've reopened Seti's tomb. So, of course, I've got to go there. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I want to go back inside the Red Pyramid um, because I, I just have to do that. But I, I'm also interested in creating a new painting um, of a mausoleum that's in Cairo mm. of one of their um, famous politicians whose name is Sahad Zaglul. Um, I want to do a painting about him and his mausoleum. So th they're the reasons I want to go back to Egypt. Wow, that'll be a trip. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess I want to do a painting about Charles Musaeus, who um, he created this thing called the Lion Path, Ooh. but is famously... Um, known as discovering a branch or inventing a branch of mathematics. He was also an Egyptologist and he discovered the pyramid of King Ameni Kormau, um, oh. whose name has come up a lot recently, or not a lot, a couple of times recently in Egyptology because they discovered uh, a stelae that references him and um, there was a collapsed pyramid that was unopened that belonged to someone who they're pretty sure was his daughter. Wow. Yeah. All these new discoveries and stuff, you know? Like, yeah. yeah. Going, going back to what you were mentioning earlier, just real quick about... Um, Egyptology changing and whatnot like that's that's one of the things that I've always loved about Egypt is that it just seems like for every one thing that we know that we reasonably know for sure about what they believed and did mm -hmm. there's like countless other things that we don't and with new information it's like you know every couple of decades or whatever we're gonna we're gonna have some new information and well, we, we, yeah, because discoveries happen, you would think that that would add to our library of how we think about the ancient comedic world. But if that library is constantly filtered through an academic lens, that only wants to see something one particular way, or if it's being filtered through the lens of Victorian England, or if it's being filtered through the lens of another religion, we're only going to get the same kind of answer. So I guess the point I was making back then is bring on all the new discoveries, but let's also look at them as ways that we can expand how we're thinking about the ancients and rather than draw a conclusion that it's, you know, more of the same to bolster up what I originally thought about them. But mm. I think that culture is so rich that there's more to it that we can, that has a, a richer yield than perhaps 
in, we're currently uh, paying full attention to anyway. I agree with you completely. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's only right I should mention a little bit of my process of how I compose the music for your film real quick. Yeah, well, I don't think real quick. I mean, it, it's an important part of the documentary, so 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 talk about it so people can know. Well, um, not not much to it, really. Uh, it's kind of like how, how you were mentioning earlier, uh, uh, the galaxy. I, th I think you mentioned it's a galaxy phone. Um, I have a uh, Samsung something or other. I don't know. I'm no good with this shit. Um, but it, it's also got like some pretty, pretty nifty apps on it and stuff. And I don't know. I just, I found like a couple of, uh, a variety of voice changers, a variety of synthesizer apps. Um, and earlier this summer, uh, when I first put together the Dua Sutek EP, uh, first of all, that whole thing was the result of pandemic mania, living in quarantine and not having enough shit to do. And one day playing around with voice changers and changing my voice over and over again. And that that's all that that album, that EP really is, is just my voice over and over again on each layer, manipulated to sound like it's not. That's awesome. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. um, with Mantis Religiosa, which is the piece I did for your film, uh, I didn't quite keep it that pure. Uh, I used a couple of different synthesizer apps that I found uh, that replicate like old school sequencers, like the kind of shit where they don't even have keys on them. Like you're you're like playing with dials and everything, you know. Um, and um, I started with that to create the basic structure or the, the, the two basic structures of, of the piece because it really ended up being divided into two. I, I'm not quite sure why it just ended up that way. Um, that, was the, that was sort of the baseline for the piece. And then uh, I went over that with my voice changer technique to make it a little bit, you know, raw, fuzzier. Uh, I really wanted to capture the idea of fluttering insect wings, mm. but um, I couldn't quite find the right noise to sample, so I just had to kind of get creative and make it myself. Mm. And um, and then, uh, but but that's not to say that there's no sampling at all, because I did decide to sample from one of my very favorite horror movies, uh, Quatermass in the Pit from 1964. A uh, fantastic British horror movie about, you guessed it, mantises from outer space that genetically modified our primate ancestors to produce the witches and warlocks that roam this planet today. That's some pretty heavy shit. I love, I love that film. And I, um, I only recently watched it because, um, like this year, because of your reference to it on one of the desert of set, um, uh, podcasts and um i i really liked that film and i know it's you know very much the era of crappy bbc effects and everything right but um still a it, great uh, story it was a great story and um i liked what they did with it like uh that that sequence where um they hooked up whatever that device was that could go back in time and they could watch through someone's brain. Right. And, and there was that massive insect people overcoming the planet and all that stuff. 
flying uh, off uh, into space and coming to Earth. And I think it was genius what, what you did with that. Um, I, I was going to ask you um, the, the very beginning of the track where the words Mantis Religiosa are spoken, I didn't know that was you. And I actually, it sounded like Vincent Price. Uh, I was trying to. <laughs> is, that what you're, is that what you're going for? Well, um, with a lot of help from the voice changers. <laughs> it worked. It worked. That sounds like Vincent Price. Oh, thanks. I, it was sort of like a little homage to uh, Alice Cooper's... Um, Welcome to my nightmare. Yeah. Um, the sequence with the Black Widow and Vincent yeah. Price showing off his spider collection, which, by the way... If you ever find a mummified, if you ever find evidence of mummified spiders, don't tell me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's just draw the line there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. I'm pretty sure there is a spider glyph. Um, there would have to be, I'm sure. I know there's scorpions. Yeah, well, de definitely, and. and um, there, there is a scorpion goddess um, who is um, a rather powerful being. Um, but, yeah, I'll, I'll find out if there's a spider glyph for you. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure that there are relatives of my family or somebody's family watching you, this documentary at home and they're wondering, why the fuck is there a mummy stripping? <laughs> what's, what's with the mummy stripping? <laughs> um, it's, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, so I, I referenced earlier that I'd made um, some short film scripts because I was looking at ways of trying to tell the story of paintings in a more creative way and i have a mummy costume in my repertoire of costumes that i've held on to from when i used to be a stripper and the mummy costume was a particularly good one that didn't get a airing because in fact it, it was part of I, I did this um, mini Rocky Horror Show version thing. Oh, okay. And so the idea was that I would do two characters from the Rocky Horror Show and two or three songs from that whilst hosting an event. And um, I, I, I did actually have a Halloween event that I got hired for um, years ago when I was living overseas. And I think I've actually got that on my Vimeo. And I, I tried to make it private, but um, I've got it as part of my profile for Star Now, which is an actor's, you know, website for mm. potential casting. Which I activated this year during the pandemic because, you know, we need to think of all of our skills and uh, different ways of making money when you're not allowed to work in a gym right. because the chief medical officer thinks it's a breeding ground for bugs. So anyway, I digress. I had, I had the mummy costume as part of Rocky's costume for when I was doing um, the Rocky horror show thing. And I thought, you know, I could use that. Um, the mummy concept um has not been lost on people that are looking deeply into the symbolism of ancient egypt as a cocoon for the soul to rise out of so um i've used it as something along those lines in the documentary um and the idea of projecting the uh, alternating picture of the coffin 
and the alternating picture of the mummified mantis because you, you realize that's what's going on while all of that's happening right mm -hmm. um having that projected onto my body onto the mummy wrappings as i go emerging into something else um i'm interested in a era of photography and then video um, from the 50s and 60s called Athletic Model Guild. And it was the beginning and perhaps precursor to bodybuilding because um, Bob Miser, who was the guy that created it, um, was interested in the male physique, as I am, not only as an artist, but as an amateur bodybuilder, I guess. Um, even though I have professionally competed and stuff like that, I still consider myself an amateur. And because I've only recently got back into some sort of shape and I guess wanted to show it off, um, was able to weave that into um, the uh, artistic interpretation of what I was doing with the documentary and so I, people will definitely look at that thing what the fuck is this um, what's going on with this in terms of telling the story of the documentary but um, I think I've weaved it in in a way that is uh, kind of interesting and certainly it was fun for me to do but um if you're looking for the inspiration for it look up athletic model model guild and um that should answer some of uh some of those questions of course i i use my makeup and stuff my makeup that i use when uh, ever i'm public with set ken um so that that of course was in there too that wouldn't be used in a um, athletic model guild shoot if I was ever to recreate one. But anyway, these are the things we do as artists to take, um, you know, different takes on things. That's really fascinating, though, um, because I have, as you as you know, with me working with all kinds of public domain footage from yesteryear i have like a curious fascination with like old i guess I'm not sure if industrial films is like the right term but like you know movies that are films that were made not necessarily as like to tell a story or whatever you know they're just like showing some aspect of culture or whatever that mm you don't really see much anymore, or at least not in, not like everywhere today, at least. Is that, is that something that still happens today, the Guild? So, um, he, Bob Miser passed away um, some time ago, and he left um, all of his work a considerable library of um, negatives and prints and, and uh, film. And that's created the Bob Miser um, organization or, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Foundation, the Bob Miser Foundation, you know, which you contribute, you can contribute to so that they can hire people to catalog and preserve these negatives and uh, films and prints because they really are telling an interesting story of, from one point of view, how the male physique and what we now know as bodybuilding was starting to emerge into Western society and culture after perhaps not being considered for thousands of years. Um, mm. the, the Greeks were really the, the last ones to really 
look at and specialize in the male form um, to the degree that they did. Um, so from you've got that from that point of view. Um, so it's interesting to look at it through that lens. There's also the, the looking at it through the lens of homoerotic male art and looking at the male body in a sexual context, which of course was taboo then mm. and, you know, is to a degree now as well, how we consider the male body in a, a, a current context and the sexualizing of it um, is another thing entirely. So he, he, all of that was there in what he was doing. And there is, um, you know, some sordid stuff because the models that he had, he had this, famously, he had this system of, for want of a better word, hieroglyphs that he used to make notes to himself about who the model was and whether or not they might, um, they may be uh, interested in sexual persuasions that uh -huh. were considered illegal at the time. I see. Um, so th there's that stream as well, which is uh, uh, interesting. <sighs> what a horrible way to live. Sounds like right. a fascinating guy, though. Yeah, he was fascinating. And his, his, as an art form in and of itself, you, you look at his art and you say, well, that's, that's Bob Miser photography. It, it, you know, in the same way that um, you might look at, and now I've gone blank, another famous gay artist that died of AIDS. What was his name? Maplethorpe. Oh! You, you look at a Maplethorpe, you look at one of his photos and you know that's a Maplethorpe, Well, you look at a Bob Miser photo and you know that's a Bob Miser photo. I so see. so he, he was, as a photographer, he was very much, he had a style happening, you know, right from the get-go. Well, that's really cool that you were able to work that influence into this. Yeah. Um, so there's like Quatermass and Mantises and 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 the male body and AMG. What say it again? The um, a AMG. That's right. Yeah. Okay. A a Athletic Model Guild. Athletic Model Guild. Like this is just such a this is such an eclectic web of ingredients. I think so. And look, I work, I very much got told earlier this year by one of the Neturu that it's time to get your stuff out there. Like do it, do it. And um, I, I've, I've held back on a lot of artistic stuff of my own over the years for whatever reason. So this documentary was in some ways a crude manifestation of a lot of things coming together in one, which um, I'm, <clears throat> as it stands, I'm happy with the way it turned out. Well, thank you so much once again for joining me tonight, Set Ken. It, it's been really a treat to have you on board. Thank you for being my first and only guest on the podcast so far and and thank you so much for the opportunity to contribute to your project i i just i really love the film and i hope that everyone out there listening will go watch it on vimeo.com and and perhaps give some consideration to visiting your patreon account as well yes that, that would be cool uh, if, if every bit helps and i think um you know, the, the Patreon, I do keep Patreon-only content for people. Not everything I publish does go um, out to the public. And that's the reason for having a Patreon as well. You want to, you know, reward the people that um, have gone that little bit step further to want to 
invest in what you're doing to one de degree or another. So um, I'm very grateful for my patrons and I'm very grateful you asked me to do this podcast and grateful for your amazing contribution to the documentary. Oh, thank you. And on that note, dua a beat and set bless. Dua a beat and dua sutek. And to close out today's adventure, here is the aforementioned track, Mantis Religiosa, that I composed for Setken's film. Again, listeners can view the praying mantis god of ancient Egypt at vimeo.com slash setken. And if you enjoy this little tune I've cooked up as an offering to Lord Abit, you can stream and download Mantis Religiosa for free at gbmarion.bandcamp.com.
listening ear to the intervention of insects. so much for listening. If you enjoyed this sermon and you'd like to read some more, please check out desertofset.com. I hope you have a wonderful day. Set bless.